The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Lit. The revolution is lit. Uhuru comrades, and welcome to today's Amali Taught Me Sunday Study, featuring Chairman Amalia Shatella. My name is Akile Anai. I'm the Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Today's study is highly important, and we encourage you right now to share this stream, invite your friends and family to it, so that as many of our people can be involved in this discussion. This week, the Chairman reads pages 1 through 42 of his new work, Vanguard Up, Unity of Theory and Practice, the political report to the first 7th Congress plenary of the African People's Socialist Party. You can find the link to download the political report in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions. This political report is the follow-up to our 7th Congress, which served to lay out the way forward for our party and movement for the next five years. In this study, the chairman clarifies what he means by vanguard up, uniting theory with practice. He details the struggles and efforts of our party to unite the movement to defeat counterinsurgency and the rebuilding of the movement after the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s. There are many things dealt with in this section, one of them being the regional strategy, which was first introduced to us at the 7th Congress. In this political report, the chairman expounds on the regional strategy, making it clear on what this strategy will result in when correctly implemented, which is the unstoppable growth of our party and movement. This document serves as the blueprint for making a revolution. It's up to the revolutionaries, the advanced attachment, to vanguard up and assume the responsibility of carrying it out. We are honored to have with us the leader and founder of this movement, the brilliant theoretician behind African internationalism, the strategist for this political report, to take us through this study and deepen our understanding of it, Chairman Omali Ishatela. Uhuru. Uhuru, brothers and sisters and comrades. We just... Uh, finished our plenary, had our plenary last weekend. Uh, actually, it, it was from the 1st through the 3rd of February. And uh, we'll be looking at the political report uh, for that plenary. We got it out rather late to members uh, of the party and our movement um, who ordinarily would have had at least a month or so uh, to read, study, struggle around uh, the plenary, which is around the political report to the plenary. And uh, we did not have that much time uh, this time out. I know that there are a lot of different committees um, who are actually currently engaged in studying the political report, and that's good. Uh, all the committees and 
all of the different organizations, party organizations, must study the political report. Uh, it was adopted at the plenary, but it's something that we need to continue uh, to look at to deepen our understanding of it. Uh, and uh, it is ex essential that we implement it. In fact, uh, the theme of the uh, first plenary to the seventh Congress, the unity of theory and practice, uh, uh, really suggests that, that the significance of actual practice. So we, we talk about the theory, uh, but uh, how we carry it out is fundamental right now. And we made some changes in the plenary that um, is consistent with our understanding of uh, accountability, uh, the responsibility to actually uh, carry out, to engage in practice. Uh, so uh, in fact, the, all of the struggles and successes and the organizational references uh, here in this uh, study, in this political report, reflect our practical application, our practical application of African internationalist uh, theory uh, uh, to concrete problems uh, and issues affecting our freedom struggle. So um, an aspect of this, we won't, we won't get 40 pages done. Uh, that was really ambitious uh, suggestion. We're going to go through this, though, and we'll do this um, uh, and probably will over a period of the next uh, two or three weeks um, finish the uh, entire study because we think it's really important that people look at it. Some of this you will be familiar with because we uh, would talk a lot about uh, the theory of African internationalism. We talk about vanguard. We're looking at uh, uh, part of this particular political report uh, lays the basis for the party, the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, having the ability to make that declaration of being the vanguard. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is a testament, testament to uh, our own sense of significance, but more than that, it's a statement about the kind of organization that we have. When people talk about vanguard, we're talking about a kind of organization uh, organized around certain kinds of principles. Uh, that allow us to give ourselves that characterization. There are and there have been other uh, vanguard organizations, but we don't see them that much nowadays. Uh, and partially it's because you don't hear about uh, the need for revolution nowadays. You don't hear about the need for actual uh, seizure and, and uh, of political power. Uh, we hear a lot about protests and demonstrations, but we, there's very little discussion about actual uh, struggling for uh, acquiring uh, political power. And that's what uh, the African People's Socialist Party is about. It's an acquisition of political power. Uh, and um, so Vanguard has a particular significance to us. So we'll say some things about that during the study about who we are as an organization, about some of the history of the party that uh, helps us to understand that. Uh, we say some things about the kind of organization we are in the process of doing that. Um, <clears throat> we will also deal with, with uh, some of the struggles uh, we have made in terms of our attempts to, during our history to uh, win the African liberation movement uh, in general to a higher standard, to having uh, some recognition of the significance of theory, of ideology, because our movement uh, has been extraordinarily weak on that front, uh, has, has always uh, been very weak on that front. And, and so we'll be looking at that, taking that on. Uh, saying some things about that, our history of attempting to involve the African liberation movement. And then in those instances where uh, there ha have been attempts to, uh, to uh, base our struggle on theory, uh, and, and so much of those attempts from, uh, were revolved around uh, philosophical idealism. Uh, we're seeing that we're struggling for a scientific approach. We have been. The history of our party has been to struggle for a scientific approach to revolution. And uh, uh, that is part of what 
allows us to characterize ourselves uh, as vanguard, this entire struggle we've been making, not just inside the African People's Socialist Party, which is, which is fundamental, but also with the overall African liberation movement. Uh, we have put forth uh, the, at this uh, particular uh, plenary, the uh, a greater emphasis stemming from our seventh Congress uh, on, on the regional strategy. And uh, so throughout this, we'll talk some about the, the regional strategy, the logic of the regional strategy. When we say regional strategy, inside the United States, the party uh, has uh, established uh, four uh, distinct uh, uh, geographical regions. <laughs> <clears throat> and the leadership of the party has, is such that uh, each of these uh, uh, regions, geographical regions in the United States, uh, has the benefit of a, a regional committee. A party has the responsibility in each of those regional committee uh, to, uh, for organizing uh, those particular regions. Uh, that's inside the United States, but also uh, we've done a similar thing uh, in Africa, uh, Europe, and wherever we're located in terms of pushing for uh, that. And the reason for that is uh, it offers uh, a kind of de decentralization under democratic centralism so that uh, it's not a matter of every decision, every question having to be resolved uh, uh, at the, at the uh, height of the top of the party organization. Uh, and um, so it also gives us the ability to determine uh, the specific responsibilities of organizing in each of these regions. That's, that's one of the things that makes it valuable. Uh, we, we'll talk some, uh, we've appointed uh, uh, at our uh, plenary, uh, we announced the appointment of uh, Chimaringa Salambayo uh, as the uh, National Director of Organization. And uh, this office is the office that is uh, all of the, the work uh, being done in the regions and the work being done uh, by the various uh, mass organizations are accountable. This is the oversight process that we've established in the party. Uh, we, we want to say that we are not anarchists and so we make certain kinds of determinations and we uh, have created structures and organization to, uh, to which uh, these determinations are accountable. We've, we've uh, uh, identified leaders uh, who are responsible for this, but we've, uh, we've uh, uh, now initiated the, Demo the National Demo uh, uh, Dep um, uh, Organizational um, leadership of, for the, the, this process. So there is leadership uh, throughout the, the, uh, the, the party structure. So it's not just we made some decisions, we hope things go well, uh, we await for the next monthly report to see how things went, uh, something to that effect, or the next plenary. Uh, so there is a director, national director organization that oversees this entire process. And so we'll know uh, from week to week uh, just how things are going and holding things exactly where, uh, where they need to be. I think one of the most important things uh, that, uh, uh, that we've determined, and the, the director of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of organization also um, is responsible for uh, promoting and, and uh, assuring that our organizational manuals and and things like this uh, are being used throughout the organization. Uh, so we don't have, you know, just <laughs> uh, anarchy, that people just sort of doing what they want to do. Uh, there are principles, organizational principles that we want to adhere to, uh, reporting uh, 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 processes and procedures that, <laughs> that we'll be working with throughout the party, throughout the organization. I think one of the most important things that we did in this plenary uh, was the discussion on the African Socialist International. Um, because the party, uh, the party is an, is an international organization, so to speak. Uh, wherever Africans are located, the party has to be there. 
Uh, and uh, so when we talk about the African People's Socialist Party uh, within the United States, for example, we're talking about uh, uh, being part of a greater organization than that which exists in, in the United States. And that is referred to as the African Socialist International. So uh, it accounts for the work that we're doing in South Africa. It accounts for the work that we're doing in the Caribbean. It accounts for the work uh, that we're initiating in, in Ghana, uh, even as this discussion is occurring in the work in throughout Europe. And we uh, placed a, a much greater uh, emphasis on the sig significance of African identity, uh, African uh, nationality. Uh, uh, we uh, make and struggle, made struggle with uh, any concept of being uh, of some African peoples or African descendants or something to that effect. Everybody, every living human being on earth is an African descendant, uh, but that's not who we are. We are Africans and that's one of the struggles that we made. We're not um, uh, hyphenated uh, white people or anything like that. Uh, and we're people of color uh, nonsense, which all of which are efforts to obscure, uh, dilute, uh, liquidate uh, the whole concept of nationality. And so uh, we talked more about the existence of the solidarity movement. And it was really important for us to have um, throughout the entire uh, plenary uh, participation uh, from uh, the African uh, People's Solidarity Committee, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Um, uh, we really struggle to deepen uh, an understanding <coughs> of uh, the significance of these uh, comrades, these forces, uh, not only organizationally and tactically and strategically, uh, but also uh, later try to deepen a theoretical uh, basis, foundation for uh, the existence uh, of, this, uh, of this force. And uh, so these are some of the things, and we talked about the specific mandates and the way forward. All of that is stuff that we'll cover here, and more, because uh, some, some things I did not mention here. So I'm beginning now on uh, what is page two of the political report, uh, with the title, Vanguard Up, The Unity of Theory and Practice. The title of the party's seventh Congress was not casually chosen, Vanguard the advanced detachment of the African Revolution is a title that reflects the weight that our party has carried nearly alone since our 1972 founding. Our October 2018 Congress occurred at a time when it was absolutely necessary for the benefit of our revolution and our party to break from the pact as a party and also for each party member to assume the responsibility of being the vanguard. Some militants have resisted recognition that the black revolution of the 60s suffered military defeat. The admission of military defeat clashes with the romantic notion of re revolutionary invincibility. Without this recognition, we operate under the false assumption that there has been uninterrupted revolutionary continuity since the 1960s. We are challenging the pervasive myth that many events represent victory for African people while in fact they are merely a counterinsurgent substitute for revolution. This is why individuals like Barack Hussein Obama and other opportunists are sometimes incorrectly viewed as successors to an unbroken trajectory of our movement for democracy and black power that inspired, organized, and mobilized millions of Africans and others within the United States and around the world. Many who participated in the black revolution of the 60s, including its leaders, were swept up in the historic inertia that overtook the oppressed of the world. In the 1960s, joining the revolution was the most natural thing you could do, as revolution was clearly the most influential driving force in the world. Revolutionary enthusiasm alone could not bestow our movements with the science of revolution, however. Sometimes it is merely the heat of the moment or youthful exuberance in the face of recognizable 
injustices that thrust people onto the path of revolution. Our party continues to engage in revolutionary struggle today because early on in our development, we acquired the science of revolution that provided the political stamina to withstand and learn from the contradictions we encountered. Indeed, we learned and developed from the defeat of the revolution. This, despite the fact that individual members of our party have from time to time succumbed to the doubts and difficulties inherent in the struggle for liberation, unification, and socialism. In our early years, our party fought pitched battles with elements of the black liberation movement to call attention to a general disdain for theory and ideological weaknesses that characterized the African anti-colonial movement of which we were a part. Those of us serious about liberation had to be able to project and defend the position of liberation versus the liberal capitulationist line of assimilation. We were determined to fight our way out of the swamps of ideological obscurantism being deliberately imposed on our struggle. <clears throat> this ability to throw up obstacles to our ideological clarity was tied to the jailing, slander, and assassinations of our revolutionary anti-colonial leaders and political philosophers. And I just want to say that uh, I mentioned here this, this whole struggle that we were making against uh, a capitulationist line of assimilation. In some ways, uh, this struggle was muddled. Our understanding uh, was challenged by a tendency uh, which was probably natural under the circumstances to simply identify uh, those who uh, were assimilationists as wanting to simply f fight to be with the white people. And there was truth to that, because there is such a thing as, uh, as a, a, a certain kind of uh, self-alienation, national alienation that occurs particularly within a sector of the African population, African petty bourgeoisie, uh, that gets trained uh, to uh, appreciate uh, the oppressor nation uh, more than those of us who are oppressed. In fact, all of the African people get trained to do that, workers you know, uh, as well as others. But there's a material basis for that that exists uh, within the African petty bourgeoisie. So the African petty bourgeoisie most often did things not simply because of some innocent uh, 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 misunderstanding or simply because uh, someone had uh, 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 slipped uh, something in their drink to make them confused. It's the fact is there's a material stake, a material interest in this uh, for them that, uh, that influences their ability to uh, succumb to the ideological assumptions associated with assimilation and being with white people. The African working class, on the other hand, uh, uh, had an totally, entirely different relationship, but always had an entirely different relationship uh, to white people and white power. Uh, we've worked for them, run from them, uh, paid them rent, and all other kinds of things uh, that, uh, uh, that were part of a material uh, relationship that we had, but there was no material, there was no interest, there was no actual uh, material interest in that. that. That that it would not serve our material interest to maintain this relationship. For example, uh, people may be familiar that during the 1950s and perhaps the early 60s, <coughs> we saw uh, a movement emerge uh, inside the United States by Africans who, uh, uh, who were being lynched, uh, who were being killed uh, on a regular basis by white people, just ordinary white people. And yet, in the face of this, there was a, a, a movement that was demanding integrating with the white people, living in the communities with the white people, going to the schools with the white people. And all the people we were talking about integrating with and uh, living next door to and going to school with were the people who were killing us. Now, logically, uh, the African working class would not be uh, demanding uh, to move next door to the lyncher, uh, to, to go someplace where we were going to be harmed like this. It's only that sector 
of the African population that had a material interest in this relationship, that benefited in some way with this relationship by being close to white people that uh, would, would want to do that. This is what I mean when I'm saying that the African working class may find ourselves succumbing to the same notions, uh, but there is no material stake in it. There's no material basis for that. The African petty bourgeoisie has a material basis in that. And so the African working class was less likely uh, to be locked into that. It, could, it could, could more easily be won away from that kind of politic, but that's the assimilationist line that we were dealing with. And not because we're saying, uh, 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 you know, because they're white and we don't like white people. Uh, there was something else that was involved that challenged this relationship. And uh, even today, I'm glad to say that uh, uh, I've heard that uh, the, the existing Nation of Islam is talking about uh, a movement that they characterize as, as uh, for separation. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm glad to hear that is because uh, it feeds into uh, our position of, uh, of, uh, of a str struggle for independence for African people all around the world. We don't say separation because there's something presumptuous about that that we think is absolutely uh, incorrect. I mean, it's like uh, when the white people who stole this land uh, from the indigenous people uh, uh, actually uh, consolidated the theft and and codified it. They didn't call it a declaration of separation. They call it a declaration of independence. And there's uh, something um, uh, much more insidious about the concept of separation. There, there's, it's, uh, it, there's this assumption that there is a, a relationship that doesn't exist. Uh, and it's one that's really important to uh, the oppressor nation rulers that somehow uh, we're struggling to separate from you when the fact is that we've never been a part of you. We want to be independent um, and in control of our own affairs. There's a distinct difference here, do you see? Uh, so um, we say the ability to throw up obstacles to our ideological clarity was tied to the jailing, slander, and assassinations of our revolutionary and, an and anti-colonial leaders and political philosophers. And it's, it, this statement uh, is a reflection of what we've always understood that it's more than simply getting rid of an individual leader that these assassinations were directed at. It was also an attack on a particular philosophy in our movement, a particular uh, uh, direction that the movement was trying to move, uh, that our people were trying to go into. That was part of it. So you kill off the, the revolutionary uh, leaders. You kill off those who uh, held up a particular philosophy and then you leave the field open uh, to uh, those who want to go in another direction. In many ways, it's the way the colonial ruling class uh, offers assistance to a sector of our community. Uh, to, it allows them uh, to surface, uh, 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 to ascend as the leaders of the community because you kill off uh, those forces who actually have this relationship and, and moving uh, in the interest of the African working class or the basic general overall uh, African population. So uh, the heated uh, struggles of African people during the 1950s and, and 1960s opened the door to hundreds of questions that demanded resolution as a condition for the further development of our revolution. Uh, and, and we were struggling around all kinds of questions. You, you know, it's not just like one day everybody woke up and, and some people uh, believed in segregation, some people believed in integration, and some people believed in, in armed struggle, and some people believed in, 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 in uh, Pacific you know, response uh, to our oppression. These, these debates, serious debates were happening in the movement. And that's really important. I mean, uh, uh, there was a serious struggle. For, for example, uh, an outstanding issue with the relationship of class, uh, to class to race. This was one of the questions because, uh, and, and I think this uh, in part may have been a reflection of, uh, of uh, an incipient recognition of the contradiction inside the African community, inside the nation itself. Uh, you had, you know, a certain sector, as I mentioned earlier, of the population wanting to go 
in a, a particular direction that the majority of the people were not served by, were not served by, but, uh, but who led the majority of the people. What is this relationship then of, uh, of a class to race? You know, because then there are the white people uh, who we uh, engaged in the struggle. And then there was also uh, the Marxists, the white people who uh, you know, were always there to t t tell us how wrong we were uh, for rejecting uh, uh, this whole uh, notion of assimilation, even if it were a left assimilation, a leftist assimilation, uh, et cetera. So what is the relationship? Uh, to class and race. Uh, and, and I'm saying that the party didn't simply wake up grappling with these questions. Uh, they were questions that permeated the entire struggle that we're involved in, this whole issue uh, of, uh, of nonviolence uh, uh, that really got confusing and confused uh, because uh, we were at one juncture able to tell who was a real revolutionary, quote, uh, based on uh, willingness to, to engage in violence. Violence became the, th the thing, as opposed to nonviolent. You knew somebody was a revolutionary because of a willingness to engage in violent uh, response uh, uh, to uh, our condition. So these were questions we were dealing with. And Malcolm X, of course, uh, was an outstanding uh, critic of this whole nonviolence, uh, nonviolent assimilationist uh, movement. Uh, that uh, affected not only uh, the struggle of African people here, but around the world. Uh, and with the, then of course the, the, the logic for it, uh, the, the Christian uh, belief that was associated with it in, in the minds of many, and, and of course uh, how King and others uh, like King uh, discussed it. In, in fact, there were some incredibly courageous people who uh, were with the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and who were with even the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who were motivated by, by Christianity uh, and some assumption of uh, nonviolence that's associated with Christianity uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, it could not explain why these Christian white people uh, organized themselves as the Klan or organized themselves as Mr. Smith. Uh, would engage uh, in, in, in committing horrible offenses, uh, violent offenses against African people. A Christian United States would engage in slavery, a Christian Germany, a Christian, uh, you know, most of Europe would engage in killing off indigenous people, colonialism, et cetera. So obviously this was not the answer. This was not the basis for it. So then, you know, we got to sort of get to the root of what the hell is going on. Is it Christianity? And then that was the basis of saying, well, it's, it's religion, Christian religion that's doing all of this to us. So we become Muslims, uh, some of us. So we have a, 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 another religious explanation for the reality that doesn't hold water either for any number of reasons, uh, uh, not the least of which of the the fact that uh, Islam engaged in, in uh, the, the, the trans-Saharan uh, slave trade for something like 1,500 years. Uh, and then the reality that um, uh, even today we look at and see uh, you know, reactionary uh, Islamic states who are murdering and brutalizing you know, uh, uh, Muslims in, in, in the, territories, uh, the t territories there. So, these issues and struggles we were having to contend with. If, uh, what is it, you know, this black nationalism that uh, sees the white man as the enemy, period, and the Africans are, you know, on the other hand, uh, collectively on the right side of the question, how do we explain uh, 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 Papa Doc Duvalier who's killing and murdering us in, in Haiti? How, how do we explain what this black man, uh, Mobutu, uh, uh, participated in, in, in killing uh, Lumumba and Congo uh, and, various, uh, and your local preacher and others in, your own, in our communities growing up that we knew uh, were committing horrible offenses against us. We, these were questions that, we, that had to be dealt with in the 1960s in particular, which was an incredible um, historical moment because uh, someone said it's the, it was the apex of, uh, of uh, African, uh, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, intellectual, you know, uh, uh, thought. It was the apex, the height of the struggle for ideological and intellectual clarity during this whole period of time. 
because um, there were so many questions that demanded resolution at this moment of, uh, of urgency uh, in the struggle of our people. So uh, we said again, the heated struggles of African people during the 1950s and 60s opened the door to hundreds of questions that demanded resolution as a condition for the further development of our revolution. As we know, the imperialist powers led by the United States waged a major attack on our revolution, crushing it before these questions could be satisfactorily resolved. For most people, that was the end of it. We of the African People's Socialist Party, however, continue to lead and develop politically and organizationally even after much of our movement had been destroyed. This is why we are here today as compared to all of the short-term revolutionaries unable to overcome their ideological limitations, surrendering to the diversions of the pedestrian struggle for survival under foreign colonial capitalist domination. Revolution is not simply an aspiration. It is the right, it is the height of the unbridled participation of the masses in political life. Revolution is not simply an aspiration. It is the height of the unbridled participation of the masses in political life. Revolution is distinguished from riots and spontaneous uprising by organization and leadership. Our oppressors recognize this and they have created a multifaceted science to prevent or destroy revolution. This science is called counterinsurgency and employs all forms of warfare, including psychological, economic, political, and especially military. When the African People's Socialist Party was founded in 1972, the Black Revolution of the 60s was on its last leg. Patrice Lumumba had been overthrown and butchered in Congo. Kwame Nkrumah was deposed in Ghana. Malcolm X, our most influential anti-colonial ideological leader, had been assassinated in the U.S. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who massified the struggle for democracy under colonial capitalism, was shot dead. Che Guevara had been wounded, captured, and murdered by the CIA in Bolivia. And Fred Hampton, the last remaining authoritative leader of the Black Panther Party in this country, was murdered in what was clearly intended as the coup de grace of our revolution. Increasingly, what we are seeing today is uh, growing uh, popular explanations in movies and things like this uh, of this important period of time. The bourgeoisie uh, still trying to drive the narrative at a time of an incipient, incipient growth of revolutionary consciousness in this country. They've gone back to that critical, increasingly they go back to that critical moment in history and recreate the history. They bring uh, uh, people who are really important to us, uh, our struggle. And they decide through, uh, through these uh, narratives that they put forth what these forces were fighting for, where it is they were trying to go. It's similar to uh, what I understand about uh, certain so-called uh, museums of, uh, of African history, one in Washington, D.C., and some in places around the South that has the ability to show Africans who were, in, who were uh, in captivity, enslaved in this country, and who uh, endured all kinds of horrible things. And sometimes they, they let you see the horrible things that we endured, uh, but we, uh, there is an end to the story. And the end to the story is now, that this is the success. We were captured. We were brought into this situation. We endured the horrible things. Uh, but the end is what we have accomplished up to now. We have now made it more or less. So there is no reason to even consider things like revolution, in fact. And it's a popular expression. They, when, at one time, they denied any uh, 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 ability to, for uh, assessing African history. Now they grab African history 
and then they tell all the horrible things that they know you're aware of, and then they give it the ending. They give it an ending that serves the uh, imperialism itself. That's the kind of thing that, uh, that they have done. And uh, so uh, I'm thinking about this when I think about Fred Hampton. We've, we've seen them do things with Malcolm X. We've seen them even do things with Harriet Tubman. Uh, they tell a story, and Africans are so hungry to have what assume, we assume to be our story, to see uh, the heroism, to see uh, uh, you know, the, the stance in, in things that we've endured. Uh, so uh, it is a welcome relief. But the, they also tell the end of the story. They tell what it's about. They tell why you were fighting, why you endured, and all you were really wanting is to be where you are now. Right? <laughs> uh, it was only because we recognized the defeat of the Black Revolution that the African People's Socialist Party was able to set ourselves on the conscious mission to complete the Black Revolution of the 60s. It made us impervious to the efforts of most aspects of the counterinsurgency. In the first place, it kept revolution on the party's agenda. We did not detour down the opportunist path of reformism looking for looking to find a way to make our colonial existence more palatable. We set out early on to expose and defeat the counterinsurgency that had played such a debilitating role in our struggle for more than two, two generations. Today, unlike the 1960s, with the exception of our party, there is no general recognition of the need for goals, objectives, and methods of revolution. The mission to complete the black revolution of the 60s is what helps to set the party apart in front, in the vanguard. We are not an organization that is starting anew after some recent epiphany. Our starting point is the black revolution of the 60s and not the latest egregious colonialist offense. The African People's Socialist Party is the only organization in the world that has maintained this crucial responsibility for all these years. Since our founding in 1972, we have never stopped struggling for liberation and socialism. We have never stopped fighting for the total liberation of Africa as the fundamental component of the worldwide struggle to defeat imperialism and liberate the oppressed nations, peoples, and workers of the world. We have never stopped struggling for liberation and socialism. We have never stopped fighting for the total liberation of Africa as the fundamental component of the worldwide struggle to defeat imperialism and liberate the oppressed nations, peoples, and workers of the world. Because we never stop struggling, our party has continued to develop, politically and ideologically, long after the counterinsurgency of the 60s neutralized the general revolutionary trajectory of our movement. This ongoing political and ideological development is what contributes to our status as the, van as the vanguard, the advanced detachment. Effectively, we have become custodians of the worldwide African revolution, the critical strategic component of the global anti-imperialist revolution. The responsibility to expose and defeat the worldwide US-led counterinsurgency is one we sought to share with the existing remnants of the black revolution of the 60s. We worked tirelessly to unite the revolutionary anti-colonial tendency of what remained of our struggle. We struggled to unite the movement to defeat counterinsurgency. In 1991, we published Black Power Since the 60s, a book based on a series of articles that appeared in the Burning Spear newspaper over a number of months. The main target of these polemics was the opportunist theory of new Africanism that was based on the premise that five southern U.S. states are the national homeland of U.S.-based Africans. This position was adapted from an earlier Communist Party effort to win the loyalty of African people in the U.S. away from the movement of Marcus Garvey by claiming that instead of Africa, the national homeland of African people in the U.S. is the U.S. Black Belt South. Beginning in the late 1960s, the Black Belt South theory was regurgitated by several groups, mostly connected with the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, RNA. 
In one passage, we address the approach by our party in the struggle against the prevailing counterinsurgency and why our approach required the anti-colonial unity of the African victims of the counterinsurgency. It was an approach to in contention with the Black Belt South tendency as represented by the RNA and NAPO, the New African People's Organization, which criminalized African people pushed into the influential U.S. government-imposed counterinsurgent <coughs> drug economy. Ours was the approach of the vanguard, as revealed here, and we quote uh, from that book. Uh, the approach of our party uh, has been to identify the counterinsurgency and all of its obvious components as a primary contradiction and to attempt to win all in our oppressed colonial community to struggle against the counterinsurgency, including the government importation of drugs into our community and the vicious war against our people in the name of the U.S. government's war against drugs. This approach makes the government the enemy and calls on everyone, including the penny ante drug dealers, to unite against the government in every way, including a cessation of distribution and usage of drugs. The other approach makes the African youth the enemy and unites with a government campaign against them. This is precisely because, it is precisely because of this theoretical reliance on the African working class as the social base upon which revolutionary struggle must depend that our party has been the only organization capable of targeting the counterinsurgency which targets the African working class, unemployed and employed, as the primary victim. The theory of our party informs us that without the conscious participation and leadership of the African working class, there would be no revolution. But because the counterinsurgency targeted the African working class, none of the anti-colonial organizations was willing to recognize it. Let's say that again. Because the counterinsurgency targeted the working class, none of the anti-colonial organizations was willing to recognize it. Most of them, some more than others, actually united with the counterinsurgent slander against our people and the so-called war on drugs initiated by U.S. President Ronald Wilson Reagan and continued under the regime of U.S. CIA President George Herbert Walker Bush, unquote. And that was a serious struggle. I mean, we literally could not get a single of the existing organizations to unite and identify the counterinsurgency. Some would say, well, we know there's some kind of low intensity war that's happening in our, you know, against black people, but they could not identify the counterinsurgency and what it looked like, how, how the drugs were there in our community. Like certainly African people acquired the contacts, the ordinary African people in the housing projects acquired the contacts, uh, the mobility, uh, uh, other kinds of skills that usually uh, we are told that African working poor people don't have, uh, that we would engage in a billion, you know, hundreds of billion dollars uh, e economic uh, venture uh, through uh, the importation and distribution of drugs in our community. Our party initiated unsuccessful efforts to bring various elements of the anti-colonial pro-independent sector of our movement under one organization umbrella, a single party that included the then existing African People's Party, APP, All African People's Revolutionary Party, AAPRP, Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa, RNA, and another armed wing of the movement. By 1974, the African People's Socialist Party was actively moving to inter internationalize African unity and to build the African Socialist International by joining with Zimbabwe African National Union, ZANU, to liberate Zimbabwe from the clutches of the white settler state of Rhodesia. We saw the ZANU movement at the time, along with the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, PAC, in colonial South Africa, as the closest potential for the creation of an all-African revolutionary party, especially the African, specifically the African Socialist International, that would direct the struggle for a liberated and socialist Africa under the leadership of the African working class organized in our own revolutionary party. Later, we sent envoys to the New Jewel Movement of Grenada and to Tomas Sankara of Burkina Faso 
in our ESI building efforts. This stemmed in part from the lessons we learned from the 60s that convinced us the African Revolution had run into its limitations when fought within the imperialist created colonial borders in Africa and among Africans throughout the world. These limitations included the ability of imperialists to destroy our revolution on separate fronts without having to fight against the entire African Revolution. We were incapable of developing a strategic approach to the overall struggle for the liberation of our people worldwide. The setbacks caused by the assassinations of our leaders in Congo and, and Ghana are only two of the most notable examples of the limitations imposed by adherence to the borders. In addition, the fact that the Soviet Union at the time was able to determine that there were only six revolutionary organizations in all of Africa deserving of its support was evidence of the need for the African Revolution to, to define for itself what constituted revolutionary organization. It was we who needed to determine what was necessary to collectivize our separate efforts and give a coherent response to our joint oppression and exploitation. In 1976, the party opened a critical new front in our struggle with the creation of the African People's Solidarity Committee. Through this organization of white colonizer nationals, the party took the struggle for black power into the cities, communities, neighborhoods, and homes of the colonizers. With the Solidarity Committee, we created a division of labor that contributed to the ability of the party to concentrate primarily on the political struggles directly confronting our colonized nation. APSC actively works to fracture the reactionary unity of the colonizer nation through winning political and material solidarity from among the colonizers. Indeed, the absolute unity of white people with their ruling class has been forever fractured by the existence of the African People's Solidarity Committee. And I want to I wanted read that again because that's going to be misunderstood by some. I'm not saying that there is no unity with the uh, uh, white people with their own ruling class. I'm saying the absolute unity, the absolute unity of white people with their own ruling class has been forever fractured uh, by the existence of the African People's Solidarity Committee. And I would extend that by saying that uh, increasingly what we will see is a greater uh, erosion of that unity uh, and a growth of uh, real solidarity. That is the basis for the existence of this, or, uh, this organization, party organization. The African People's Solidarity Committee works directly under the leadership of the party. This is crucial because of the role, play, role played by opportunism in undermining our struggle against colonial capitalism. Of course, a significant location of this opportunism has been with the participation of colonizer nation whites, liberals and leftists. Their comfortable place on the pedestal of our colonial oppression made it possible and likely that they would fight and settle for political solutions that fell far short of the structure of the colonialism that fed, clothed, and housed them. And that is true. And so someone say, well, Chairman Amali, if that is true that, uh, that uh, this place on the pedestal uh, makes it likely that they would fight and sell for political solutions that, that uh, fall short of the destruction of the colonialism that fed, clothed, and housed them, well, how does that change? What, what makes it significant now? And the fact is that anybody with eyes to see and ears to hear uh, can realize that the ability of, uh, of uh, this, this, this process to continue uh, is increasingly being challenged. This is part of what the crisis of imperialism is all about. This is part of how we understand uh, the spike in suicides and, and uh, death rates and drunkenness and what have you uh, in the white community and also it's how we understand partially what's happening with Trump uh, uh, and others who are on the extremes of left and right as they characterize it in the United States at this point. There's no, increasingly, there's no center. <laughs> and this is distressing for a lot of people. There seems not to be a political center increasingly. Uh, uh, and it's precisely uh, because uh, it is um, 
this challenge that is happening. It's a real material challenge. I mean, no, somebody, nobody, you know, uh, woke up and, and just had epiphanies. I mean, some people did do this, but it was based on something that was happening in the real world. That, that was challenging, even uh, the ability to assume uh, an unending uh, uh, kind of uh, existence on the backs of the peoples of the world and made it necessary to even recognize uh, that uh, this precarious relationship that you have here. If it's the pedestal is, is shifting, it's moving, uh, and uh, this makes it necessary for people who never had to even give any thought to the relationship. You know, nobody thinks about the relationship. I mean, it's like air. When you breathe it and you don't even give it a thought until you can't get it anymore. And that's the, this relationship that exists between white people and the rest of the world. It's just the way it is. Uh, until, um, like Saturday, I understand, uh, somebody, they say, dressed in an Afghan uniform starts shooting U.S. troops who are occupying Afghanistan. You know, that they are, they are they are occupying somebody else's country, and uh, now uh, you know they're waking up dead, <laughs> and uh, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, as we summed up in the chapter, the theory of African internationalism in the political report to the party's sixth Congress published as an uneasy equilibrium, the African revolution versus parasitic capitalism, I quote, Africans are not a race, but a nation of people forcibly dispersed throughout the globe. We have been pushed out of history by our imperialist oppressors, partially through the concept of race, unquote. The definition of the conditions of African people in the U.S. and around the world as colonialism and not racism informed our party's practice since our very foundation and was Fundamental to our struggle to complete the black revolution of the 60s. In 1975, we published a pamphlet colonialism, the major problem facing black people uh, in the U.S. But also, um, you know, just during the plenary, we were looking at a, a pamphlet uh, from our archives that was uh, published by Jomo, the uh, predecessor uh, of, uh, of, the, of the party, that was uh, published uh, in 1971 uh, in, against colonialism, defining the struggle as colonialism. So, this is something that we and sectors of the African liberation movement at one point had been grappling with for a while. Uh, we took it further than most because uh, what we found is that some people were using the term racism and colonialism interchangeably, uh, but you have entirely different um, uh, practices that would uh, uh, reflect the struggle against quote unquote racism and a struggle against colonialism and it's an entirely different mission. Uh, it's hard to get white people to fight against racism uh, as it's characterized. It's just fighting against ideas and uh, but even uh, reactionary white people can fight against colonialism believe it or not uh, and we saw that in Algeria and other places uh, where white people who were French uh, they didn't necessarily like uh, uh, the Algerians, but they didn't like being a colonial occupying force that was causing them treasure and lives to try to defend. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, we've seen white people in other situations, colonizers, uh, who uh, didn't like being the colonizers but loved being white, and, and uh, who uh, didn't even like necessarily those who were colonized but didn't like, again, being the colonizer because of its cost. Cost in terms of treasure, cost in terms of lives, cost even in terms of morale, uh, being responsible for killing children, murdering children all around the world. Even You don't have to like the black people uh, not to be wanting to be a part of that kind of exercise. So it's, the question is clarifying, depending on whether you're fighting against racism, because in some ways the fight against racism can be seen as a fight uh, by white people against white people, against whiteness, against who they are. And white people can no longer, can no more uh, uh, not be white people uh, than Africans can not be Africans. So that's a kind of trap that people are locked into uh, that reinforces the very thing that 
that they say they are fighting against. So, the definition, uh, uh, so we say that uh, through this understanding, we were correctly able to define the white population in the U.S. and worldwide, uh, not as racist, but as the colonizer nation whose entire existence rests on the pedestal of the colonial domination of African people and the majority of humanity. We were very clear that white liberals and leftists are part of the colonizer nation. As such, they bring an imperial attitude and power and the power of the colonizer into every relationship they enter, both personal and political. Thus, on occasions, we have branded them ideological imperialists and Ku Klux communists. It is in an effort to obscure this colonial relationship, liberals of both the colonizer and colonized nations refer to white status as white privilege. It is actually the privilege of the colonizer over the colonized in the same way that slave owners have privilege compared to the enslaved. While, when engaging in the fight against colonialism, we do not make the assumption that the colonized can eliminate the privilege uh, without destroying the system of colonialism any more than the enslaved could in the privilege of the enslaver without the destruction of slavery. When not, un and I think that's important, you know what I mean? Because people running around talking about white privilege and or white supremacy, we're fighting against the white supremacy. What in the hell is the white supremacy, right? Uh, you, you can't define the relationship. You, define an attitude, you define an idea, or you lay it out there, you don't really define it. But uh, So if we're not under the leadership of the party and left to their own devices, this relationship has resulted in colonizer nation leftists fighting for or having actual power within our movement and thereby reinforcing the colonial domination that oppresses our people. Opportunism within the colonized African nation resulted in African capitulation to white left and liberal demands and aspirations as a condition for acquiring their support, which in any case was mostly verbal and charitable. This kind of relationship actually undermined African self-determination. I've seen this and had discussions with African uh, anti-colonial forces in this country who uh, ended up having to explain their relationship uh, and a certain uh, subservience to uh, 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 whites uh, who were in solidarity with the struggle of black people um, uh, because of the money. They've said that. And I was in uh, Holland uh, several years ago at an international meeting of uh, people who were supposed to be involved in revolutionary struggles and uh, had s supposedly a lot of uh, unity with the people in the Philippines. And uh, I was startled by the huge influence uh, in everything that happened in this conference uh, that uh, of, of, uh, of German communists and other Marxists, white Marxists, and uh, was told, you know, that they pay the bills. I was told by, you know, by them that this is, this is the case. And so the, the, you know, the struggle goes in a particular direction because of uh, the resellers because of the, the resources uh, that, uh, that uh, the colonized, in this instance, were able to accept uh, for uh, capitulation. So, uh, opportun so we say opportunism within the colonized African nation re resulted in African capitulation to white left and liberal demands and aspirations as a condition for acquiring their support, which in any case was mostly verbal and charitable. This kind of relationship actually undermined African self-determination. The unity of theory and practice requires concrete material solidarity with the anti-colonial struggle led by the colonized ourselves. This was a challenge to the cheap, meaningless slogans preferred by white communists and opportunist African assimilationist liberals calling for black and white to unite and fight. These empty slogans failed to target, colon and this is a time where these were the communists who really loved us because they would say things like, black and white unite and fight, you know? So, <laughs> uh, for what? 
And that's always the question, for what? And uh, so these empty slogans uh, fail to target colonialism, a stand that de de demands both the recognition of the requirement for the colonized to lead our own struggle and an active fight against our colonial domination. The party's practical work in this arena also contributed to our pioneering theoretical work that revealed the historical contradiction in the struggle for socialism, namely that the colonial white working class has functioned as a retardant on the fight against capitalism. Marx's early dictum that wage slavery in Europe required as a pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world was simply another way of saying that all capitalist activity rests on a foundation of the oppression of the colonial subjects of the world. Slavery and colonial capitalism not only gave birth to the bourgeoisie or the white ruling class, it was also the progenitor or parent of the white working class. Without revolutionary African internationalist leadership, the majority of whites of the colonizer nation experience the crisis of imperialism as their own and not without reason. This is why solidarity with the colonized African working class working under its leadership cannot be seen as beneficent charity on the part of the colonizer nation leftists, but as recognition that the road to socialism uh, truly is painted black. The strategic leadership of the overall fight against capitalism is to be found in the struggle against colonialism, the pedestal. The strategic leadership of the struggle for socialism is to be found in the party of the African working class that must lead the anti-colonial struggle for national liberation, thereby depriving the capitalist parasite of its life-given colonized host. The African People's Socialist Party has provided the theoretical leadership that has long been missing from the struggle for African liberation and the defeat of capitalism and the victorious emergence of socialism. The December 2013 political report to our sixth Congress employing groundbreaking African internationalist analysis, elaborated on the critical role of the African liberation movement in the, the in the defeat of capitalism. And I'm quoting here. The white left has always been locked into a worldview that places the location of Europeans at the center of the universe. If this were not the case, Marx would have been forced to declare that the road to socialism, socialism is painted black. The destruction of the pedestal upon which all capitalist activity occurs not some maturation of contradictions within European capitalist society resting upon the pedestal is the key to overturning imperialist capitalism. In an earlier work titled The Poverty of, Philo of Philosophy, Marx made this startling admission. Direct slavery is just as much the pivot of bourgeois industry as machinery, credits, etc. Without slavery, you have no cotton. Without cotton, you have no modern industry. It is slavery that gave the colonies their value. It is the colonies that created world, world trade. And it is world trade that is the precondition of large-scale industry. Without slavery, North America, the most progressive of countries, would be transformed into a patriarchal country. Wipe North America off the map of the world and you will have anarchy, the complete decay of modern commerce and civilization, cause capitalism to, to disappear, cause slavery rather to disappear, and you will have wiped America off the map of nations. Let's see this again. Without slavery, North America, the most progressive of countries, would be transformed into a patriarchal country. Wipe North America off the map of the world, and you will have anarchy, the complete decay of modern commerce and civilization. Cause slavery to disappear and you will have wiped America off the map of nations. What an ex excellent formula for the overthrow of capitalism. The slavery of today is comprised of the colonial subject and oppressed peoples of the world. The existence of our party and the convening of our sixth Congress are part of the trajectory to cause slavery to disappear and objectively to achieve the consequences predict consequence predicted by Marx. From its inception, our party has fought for ideological clarity. We rejected the mysticism and other forms of philosophical idealism that characterized much of the anti-colonial tendency of our struggle. Our position was then as it is now. Theory is critical, but theory that cannot be implemented is worthless. It is 
in the spirit of the oft-recognized maxim by Karl Marx that, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted, world, interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it, unquote. We too believe that there must be a unity of theory and practice. And in the party we often state, it is not what we say, it's what we do. Our theory is African internationalism, an advanced scientific revolutionary theory of practice. It was with this clarity that we struggled with both African and white left opportunism to expose and defend, defeat the counterinsurgency. Indeed, it was this clarity that enabled us to survive the counterinsurgency and emerge as the vanguard. African internationalism recognized by a colonial university. On January 24, 2019, the Oxford Union of Britain's University of Oxford, one of the most prestigious bourgeois universities in the world, hosted a debate on the Africa question where I spoke as an invited participant. There was a total of six participants in the debate, three, of, three on each side of the question of the desirability of greater African Union. However, it was clear from the beginning that the Oxford Union and all the debate participants were most interested in my contribution to the debate and that it was my participation that allowed the event to be even characterized as a debate. And it's really interesting because uh, I remember when I received uh, the letter from Oxford Union um, via email, I was startled uh, to get it and even consider the possibility of it being a hoax uh, that Oxford uh, would uh, be inviting me uh, to come and speak there. And uh, we had some serious kinds of discussion about whether or not we should do it. Uh, and, you know, we were influenced a little by the fact that we knew Malcolm had done, gone to Oxford. Uh, and we also knew the influence of uh, Oxford, the university, and, and uh, it being a sort of training center for um, uh, the imperialist, uh, Im for imperialist rulers, leaders, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom and also for the neo-colonial forces uh, attached to, to the United Kingdom. And uh, so we talked about it and thought it, would, it was something to do, uh, that we should do it, and we should do it uh, uh, because it would give us access uh, to so many more uh, uh, Africans that we could than what we would achieve uh, on our own. But it was, uh, it was a discussion. It was not something that we say, wow, let's go to Oxford, you know. And uh, we were startled even to uh, receive the invitation uh, because we didn't know, for example, that anybody at Oxford would have been watching what we were doing and saying. We weren't writing for any kind of, uh, you know, academic um, entities and what have you. We, you know, pushing a revolutionary agenda. So the Oxford Le Union's letter of invitation recognized the theoretical contributions of African internationalism that was the obvious basis uh, for the invitation. We are clear that the bourgeoisie would have its own reasons for offering the invitation to me, not the least being the anticipation of African internationalism is the advancing theory of the oppressed that is necessarily, that is increasingly guiding the struggle of Africans and other subject peoples against imperialism that the international bourgeoisie will have to fight. However, from our perspective, the off Oxford event served to validate African internationalism as a legitimate philosophical system within bourgeois academia and thereby gives us access to an international community that we could not have achieved alone. Subsequently, at least two million Africans and others have seen the debate that has been shared thousands of times on social media. The letter of invitation from the Oxford Union for our participation in the debate was clear in its recognition of the contributions of our party to the body of socialists and revolutionary theory. And here's a meaningful passage, quoting, uh, Dear Mr. Ishatel, I hope this email finds you well. I'm writing to extend an invitation to speak at the Oxford Union in our forthcoming term. Founded in 1823, the Oxford Union is the largest society at the University of Oxford 
and one of the most famous student societies in the world. In the past, we have hosted visits ranging from U.S. Presidents Reagan, Nixon, and Carter to Morgan Freeman and Malcolm X. However, we are famous for debating, moreover, we are famous for debating the most important and pressing issues of the day, from a liberty and security debate last year to the king and country debate of 1933. With a lifetime of fighting for freedom for African people, you are a globally inspiring champion for racial equality and socialism. Your vision has been crucial to shaping the theory of African internationalism and indeed the socialist movement worldwide. This timely debate would be hugely benef benefited by your irreplaceable perspective and input." Unquote. The party's advanced theory of African internationalism. The fact that our party uses some of the same words as others who claim to be revolutionaries and socialists contributes uh, to the inability of some to distinguish the advanced character of our theoretical works or to recognize African internationalism as a distinct school of revolutionary socialist theory. Many party and Uhuru movement members are neophytes who, due to the counterinsurgency, are only recently entering into revolutionary political life. Because many are often ill-equipped to understand the leadership provided by our party in the realm of advanced revolutionary theory, I have personally held a weekly online political education series every Sunday morning for the past several years. Our party is responsible for the advent of advanced theory necessary for revolution, African internationalism. The political report to our sixth Congress published as an uneasy equilibrium quoted earlier, dedicated an entire chapter to the theory of African internationalism the revolutionary worldview of the African working class. And here's an excerpt, quote, the science of African internationalism enable our party to avoid the ideological pitfalls that validate the assumption of the superiority of white people. Thus, we have never been diverted from our mission of capturing power and uniting Africa and our nation under the leadership of the African working class. Our party brought science to our defeated African liberation movement at a time when it was generally bogged down in racial and cultural nationalism that indulged in candlelit ceremonies, religious obscurantism, and nostalgia for an often imaginary African past. Through African internationalism, we were able to discover the material basis for the exploitation and oppression of Africans and others in this world. With African internationalism, we can understand the material forces at work in the movement of history. We can clearly see the current shift in the balance of power between the oppressor and the oppressed, between Europe and the rest of us, between the so-called white man and the so-called black man. We determined long ago that characterizing our movement as a struggle against racism was a self-defeating waste of time. What is called racism is simply the ideological foundation of capitalist imperialism. Racism is a concept that denies Africans our national identity and dignity rather than defining the system of our oppression. It relegates us to the Sisyphean task of winning acceptance from and often of becoming one with our oppressors. With African internationalism, we have proven that race is simply a colonial invention originating from the enslavement and colonization of Africans and Africa that gave birth to capitalism and simultaneous, simultaneously the European nation." Unquote. Being the vanguard or advanced detachment has meant that we have had to constantly challenge and defeat orthodox, outdated, and hidebound assumptions that function as rigid, fossilized traditions. We continue with the quote from An Uneasy Equilibrium. For us, the rise of capitalism in the world is not based on some purely abstract Marxist theory about the development of human society. It is not a theoretical question. Primitive accumulation is not a theory. The rape of Africa, the enslavement of our continent and our people, the forcible dispersal of Africans throughout the world as a means of rescuing Europe from disease and poverty, the process that gave rise to capitalism is a matter of historical record. Marx, the spectator, did not have to understand this. The person sitting on the hot stove, the living, breathing, thinking, primitive accumulation would either understand this question or perish. 
we chose to understand. More than that, we chose to develop a worldview stemming from this understanding. This is the origin of African internationalism. African internationalism is simply the worldview stemming from a historical materialist investigation and analysis of the world, with the starting point being the experience and role of Africans in Africa in the advent of capitalist imperialism as the rise of white power. Parasitic capitalism is the real issue. It is this reality that ultimately distinguishes African internationalist socialism from the struggles for white rights that usually characterize most movements of Europeans worldwide. It is the difference in socialism resulting from overturning the pedestal upon which all capitalist activity occurs and some variation of the national socialism achieved by the infamous Nazis of Germany. White people have been mobilized by the inability of capitalism to live up to their expectations. They are demanding to be restored to their rightful place atop the pedestal of capitalist prosperity, sharing in the stolen loot of colonial plunder. The problem is that this can only happen at the expense of the well-being of the historical victims of capitalist prosperity, the subject and colonial peoples of the world whose exploited labor and resources create the pedestal upon which all white people sit. Europe's economic uncertainty has been brought about by oppressed peoples who are currently fomenting the crisis with our struggle for the recapture of our resources, our sovereignty, dignity, and our history. It is an error to assume that primitive accumulation is dead history, something that happened a long time ago with no implications for today. The truth is that today's capitalist imperialist structures, the ones being challenged in a thousand different ways, are structures that originated in the very genesis of capitalism as it emerged through the assault on Africa and the majority of humanity from the primordial sludge of backward and disease-ridden Europe. These understandings of African internationalism require action. They are not for consumers of information. Our party's theory is the only body of political understanding that can make sense of what is happening in the world today. Our African internationalist theoretical contributions serve to break the shackles historically imposed on revolutionary theory as perceived through the lenses of oppressor nation intellectuals whose worldview was determined by their existence on the pedestal of our oppression. African internationalism, for the first time, allows for Africans and the oppressed of the world to become the subjects of history, defining our own destiny, something not possible with the theory of Marx or his contemporaries and followers. Today, the conditions of the real world manifested by the crisis of imperialism are beginning to confirm what African internationalism has so long predicted. The reality of primitive accumulation of capital and the fact that capitalism was born at the expense of the suffering of African and indigenous peoples and is therefore parasitic. The reality of Africa as one peop Africans as one people dispersed around the world who are colonized wherever we may be located. The understanding that African people live under a policy of U.S. counterinsurgency in the U.S. These are some African internationalist understandings whose significance is becoming recognized by the world. African people, like all humanity, have always been motivated by the struggle to understand our place and destiny in the world. We, like others, have, through our collective life experiences, been compelled to find answers to the fundamental philosophical questions revolving around the primacy of the spiritual versus the material world. What is the basis of our oppression? Can the answers be found in religious scripture? Are we oppressed because we have offended the gods or perhaps sought solace from the wrong gods? Are the white colonial oppressors and some of the African petty bourgeoisie correct when they say we are experiencing the consequences of insufficient civilization or inadequate education or that we are morally depraved? Those who see the spiritual as primary are philosophical idealists. For them, the idea of reality is greater than reality itself. For idealists, the real material world is dependent on the spiritual. Philosophical idealists do not look for answers about the nature of the world by examining the world itself. They see the world as the creation of an external force that is incapable of standing up to scientific investigation. This is a ruling class worldview that is funneled into the consciousness of their working masses through the African petty bourgeoisie. 
as well as other petty bourgeois and bourgeoisie, bourgeois mediums. Philosophical idealism assumes there are things that humans are unable to comprehend. It claims that the hand of the mysterious is somehow responsible for what we perceive as reality. During the historical period when our party was founded, philosophical material idealism was central to the worldview of the black liberation movement, which relied mainly on religious, moral, and colonial explanations to understand and analyze our situation. The African People's Socialist Party sprang from the very bowels of the remorseless reality and struggles of our people. As we developed, we were increasingly forced to shed all reliance on religion, other forms of superstition, and the goodwill or moral epiphany of our oppressors. Our struggles to understand our reality, while occasionally encumbered and influenced by the worldview of the educated and upper classes, were rooted in attempts to solve the real problems of the concrete contradictions in which our people are embroiled. We were forced to learn that our preconceived notions gleaned through colonial civic book, civics books, preachers, and liberal white friends only helped to obscure the real contradictions with which our people are confronted. We came to recognize that we must understand the world just as it is, not as we would wish it to be. We were forced to become philosophical materialists. Materialism teaches us that the world is tangible, knowable, and can be experienced through the senses. It teaches us that all existing phenomena result from material causes that come into being, develop, and pass away according to the laws of the motion of matter. Materialism informs us that the material world is primary. It is objective reality that exists independently of the minds and wills of individuals. It does not require the permission of gods or important persons for its existence. The development of African People's Socialist Party during our historical 41-year trajectory in the midst of intense struggles compelled us to understand that the savage and genocidal brutality inflicted upon our people and the world by European or whites has a material basis. It is not due to the will of the gods or simply some moral deficiency on the part of whites. Our party and movement were forced to conclude that all humans, including Europeans, are trapped by an absolute necessity to secure and develop the means of subsistence. In other words, the primary motivating factor in human society is production and reproduction of life. Without life, all other questions, religion, culture, genetics, etc., are moot, meaningless. Indeed, culture is a byproduct of the process of producing and reproducing life. However, the process of Africans producing and reproducing life was drastically disrupted and altered by the European attack that resulted in the capture and colonial enslavement of African, of African Africans. This attack by Europeans on Africa also resulted in the imposition of artificial borders that separate the dispersed African nation from our human and material resources and from a meaningful relationship among ourselves and with the peoples of the world. Let's see. I think we should stop here just because uh, we need to have some time for discussion. And um, there's, there's other stuff. I think this is a really important chapter that we extracted this quote from. And there are other things that we need to be able to say about it. But I think we should stop now and uh, open it up for discussion. Uhuru. Uhuru. Well, first and foremost, let's just give a round of applause to our leadership for that amazing study. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. Uhuru, so it's your turn. It's time to open up with questions from our audience and online viewers. We want to appreciate everyone who's tuning in via Facebook and YouTube, and also appreciate all of your engagement. Please continue to invite your friends and family to the study and share widely on all of your social media platforms. So before we get into questions, I wanted to recognize um, where people are watching from. We have Somerville, Massachusetts, The Gambia, Hempstead, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boston, Massachusetts, Oakland, California, British Virgin Islands, Kuwait, St. Louis, Missouri, Toronto, Canada, Indiana, Trinidad, Spokane, Washington, Nassau, Bahamas, 
Huntsville, Alabama, Houston, Texas, Fort Myers, Florida, San Diego, California, Tucson, Arizona, Detroit, Michigan, Cincinnati, Ohio, Virginia Beach, um, Virginia, and Newark, New Jersey. So um, just trying to get to the questions. Um, we have one question from Nasir Alamin, and he is located in Kuwait. He says, in the text, so this is, um, this isn't coming from the political report, but it's coming from another piece that, um, or it's coming from the quotations of um, Chairman Amalia Shatella under the section dual power, self-reliance, and self-determination. The chairman mentions that the motive of one's business must be more than simply money making, that one should have an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist strategy and conception. So my business is, so my question is as a business, Man, woman, what does a business strategy that is anti-capitalist look like for the doctor, local coffee shop owner, the barber shop, and counseling center owner? I think that um, there are two things we want to mention. That uh, the struggle of African people um, is a struggle against colonialism. So it's a struggle for national liberation. The entire nation is involved in that struggle. And the struggle of, to liberate the nation is one that affects the doctor and the, the coffee shop owner and, and everybody else, regardless of where they are as a class. And therefore, it means that everybody can involve in the struggle against foreign or colonial domination, can. It uh, doesn't mean that everybody will, because uh, some people do capitulate and find that their interests are connected to a sector of the empire. But that's the basis of being able to say that all can participate. We saw like in the struggle of Vietnam, the courageous Vietnamese people, um, uh, the most powerful example of, uh, of resistance against imperialism, uh, all kinds of forces under the leadership of the Vietnamese Communist Party participate in that revolution. And that's the part of what gave validity to, uh, to the struggle. Uh, that's part of what um, locked the struggle of the individual uh, entities into an anti-colonial struggle. Uh, because otherwise, even what people who do who are part of an oppressed nation to uh, try and um, um, uh, ameliorate their relationship it will be self-serving. So what is powerfully needed is the existence of the revolutionary movement. And uh, so that is a critical thing that has to be said. In Vietnam, I use that example, we saw monks and you know, all kinds of forces who were not communists, or who were not working class as such, but, uh, uh, but they had national dignity. And it was Ho Chi Minh uh, who was a communist uh, who uh, put forth the slogan that sort of galvanized the entire uh, Vietnamese people. There's nothing more precious than freedom and independence. And so even the, uh, uh, the lawyers and other people who lived in Vietnam were able to be mobilized by that. That's one of the things that we say too about the way we handle the struggle that we mentioned in this text uh, and the struggle with the new Africanist tendency uh, where we, our, our position uh, was to identify uh, the, uh, the attack on the drug economy in our communities as an attack on the whole people. Uh, it was an attack on the whole people, but it was centered uh, in the African working class. That's one of the things that made certain sectors, the petty bourgeoisie, capable of being able to unite in the attack against us because it was centered on the working class who strategically is the most significant force to make this revolution. So it took the party to be able to raise up this question in a way that would help the entire nation be able uh, to see its way forward. So I'm saying that all of these forces that you just mentioned suffer colonial domination, national uh, domination, but the party is the only organization that is capable of uniting the entire nation in an anti-colonial struggle. So uh, in a real anti-colonial struggle uh, that liquidates all dependency and also that results in transforming society so that the people who do the producing are also the people who do the owning. 
that's the thing that ultimately that would equalize the relationship uh, between the barber and, and the shop owners and the other forces that was mentioned by this comrade, Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. Um, this next question, well, it's not really a question, it's um, kind of a comment, but I'm sure you could expound on it, Chairman. Um, this is from Tachara Masimba in St. Louis. He says, Uhuru Chairman, in terms of counterinsurgency, you mentioned a word called pacification. I think this term is important to understand. Critical to the counterinsurgency is to destroy, isolate, and diminish the influence of the revolution and replace it with the petty bourgeoisie, i.e. pacification. After pacification had been achieved, the imperialists will actually call for elections to happen, which is, of course, designed to give legitimacy to this colonial democratic process. In an attempt to quantify and measure the success of counterinsurgency, one imperialist think tank concluded that key pacification variables were present in every successful counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency efforts studied. So that was the, his comment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and, and that is true. I mean, that's even when we look at what's happening in elections and what have you today, I mean, we see, I mean, even Obama. Obama uh, was, a, is a, was a traitor. He's a traitor, among other things. He's a traitor to the African nation, um, and uh, among other things. Uh, and he's a traitor to uh, the working and oppressed peoples of the world. Uh, but the reason Obama uh, was able to even uh, make the pretense of representing uh, black people, uh, et cetera, is because of pacification. And the masses have been pacified, and that's the, that was the only thing that prevented that from happening. But the only place Obama ran into a problem was in St. Petersburg, Florida, when he came to Gibbs High School in August of 2008. And the party was here. And the party, you know, just asked a simple question, a simple question that clarified everything. Uh, what about the black community, Obama? And that blew everything. It was the first time anybody ever saw Obama stuttering in public and whatever, because he couldn't respond honestly to that question. And uh, of course, the, the African masses who were there didn't want him to respond, didn't want him to be put in such a place. I mean, uh, people all around the world uh, uh, were Africans and others were so offended that we asked Obama just that simple question. Just that simple question. Uh, so that uh, they responded in such a fashion that uh, they crashed our, our website and what have we. Just so many people came attacking us f uh, for having you know, even raised that question. But he couldn't have. It took pacification uh, to do that. Otherwise, Obama could, never could have become president if, if the masses, if the revolution had been pacified, if there were Panthers and, and, and Jomo and uh, uh, you know, uh, Malcolm and other forces on the ground, uh, he never could have had that easy path that would, could, uh, white people felt like they could trust him to control the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So another comment slash question seeming, uh, this is from Comrade Kabula in Chicago, says, Uhuru, it appears the African national flag is being increasingly flown. However, it's mostly being called the African American flag. This is seen in headlines around the St. Louis government flying the flag on one of their buildings, and also in Chicago, my job raised the flag only to call it the African American flag. So that was yeah, that's idea. that's happening more and more. And again, this is the petty bourgeoisie and and, and the imperialists trying to get in front of the question of uh, the deepening, growing national consciences of African people. We used to just be niggers and jigaboos and porch monkeys and and spear chuckers and. Uh, a whole bunch of other things. And we are still that in some places around the world, uh, even openly. Uh, but the closer we get to uh, identity uh, as African people, then the more the, the imperialists try to get in front of it, and especially the African petty bourgeoisie, because it was Jesse Jackson and a host of other Negroes who held their own little conference. I can't remember the year. Uh, that they did this. Uh, this was in the wake of the young African people beginning to wear uh, African medallions and things like this uh, in this country. And they had a conference. Uh, and where they decided henceforth, a press conference, they put the press conference that African black people in the United States would be known as African Americans. The closer we got to Africa, uh, the necess and something that was recognizable, then they did the hyphen, which is nothing but a chain to America, so we became Americans. And now you got Negroes uh, in, in office, 
in St. Louis, treacherous Negroes who are actually working uh, to bring a government spy station there who are actually uh, participating with the attempts being made, uh, the effort being made to, uh, to reduce the number of wards uh, in St. Louis, thereby reducing the potential for African people to have any power uh, dispersed in the community, making the numbers of African people uh, uh, less effective uh, in the contention for power. Uh, they now are raising, under the American flag, the red, black, and green, they're characterizing the African-American flag. How the hell is that possible? That flag was, was, uh, was flo first flown uh, in 1920. And it was first flown at a conference, convention of the, of the Negro peoples of the world that was organized by Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League. And it was a convention that was attended by from 25 to 50,000 African people from around the globe and adopted and if you go and look at maps of Af look at flags of Africa you will see how many of those flags have adopted some elements of the red black and green that Garvey put forth then and these are negroes who are just trying to keep african people chained to america and uh, uh, we're reducing we're getting rid of all chains we don't accept any chains anymore and if they want to be chained that's their problem mm -hmm. uhuru uhuru so one question comes from Shanta Howard um, from Virginia Beach. She asks, um, why haven't we filed suit against the cotton industry for human rights violations slash slavery? That should be in the reparations conversation to include reallocating tangible resources into the hands of, um, I'm gonna say, into the hands of African people. Um, it's, the identification of Africans is different how they wrote it, but. I think that, um, that And uh, we are seeing um, uh, various suits being filed uh, in U.S. courts uh, uh, directed at, at various industries and things like that. Uh, and Chicago uh, has a you know, really important uh, city ordinance, uh, slavery disclosure ordinance, uh, that was uh, put forth to, for any business uh, uh, in Chicago over a certain, with the, certain number, I think, of uh, employees has to uh, disclose how much they or their predecessor uh, were involved in slave trade. So I think all of that's good, and I think it helps to raise consciousness, and I think people will file those suits. But in the final analysis, um, African people will have to get our reparations ourselves. I mean, the same U.S. courts that we would be asking to uh, provide reparations of those that uh, have historically validated the right of uh, the enslavement of African people. And, and I think court decisions can be uh, determined by the power of movements on the ground. Uh, and I think we should do that. I think we should, you know, pass, you know, move the kind of suits that sisters talked about. And, and uh, by the way, uh, in uh, April, April 10th through the 12th, uh, in, in St. Louis, uh, this coming, uh, in St. Louis, there's going to be a Black is Black electoral school uh, where the reparations discussion will be held uh, as a part of uh, that process, and you should come. That's going to be in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, uh, and you should offer that up because we want people uh, coming to the reparations question from all angles and pushing uh, everything that can be pushed that demands reparations, file suits, have demonstrations, do everything that can be done to raise the reparations question up. And the final analysis, we're gonna have to take it ourselves though. Uhuru. So that's all we have um, with questions right now, Chairman. Uhuru. Uhuru. So uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, I mean, that was an important question uh, that this sister just raised. And the reparations issue is one whose time has come. And that's one of the reasons that we see some of the politicians now who are even running for president who talked about policing, giving reparations to African people. It's a question that they want to get in front of. Because in final analysis, if African people were paid really the value that we have created uh, for this economy, uh, in this country alone, uh, the country could not, uh, could not survive that kind of payment. It's, there's nothing here. Uh, in this country that does not have its origin, 
uh, in the theft of African labor uh, that was applied uh, uh, on, on stolen indigenous land. It, it would be, it's hard to even quantify. We did a, we did a, a, a tribunal. Uh, in fact, the first tribunal on reparations that ever happened uh, in Brooklyn, New York in 1982. And at that time, uh, we provided documentation that the United States government owed African people just in labor alone $4.1 trillion. And even that was a horrible understatement. Uh, we're increasingly learning uh, what the process of quantifying the value of stolen labor uh, looks like. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I think we should push it on every question uh, because, uh, you, know, you know, you see this, this fat white guy standing up, uh, you know, talking about uh, you poor, you ain't got nothing, so what you got to lose, vote for me and the Republican Party. I mean, all kinds of insults that African people have to tolerate. We have to push back, and I think the reparations demand is one way we push back. I think you should demand that all your white friends push for reparations too. It's good to have that discussion here, but you know, the white people who love us, you know, the, the white leftists and liberals in your communities should be, uh, that demand should be made to them, and, and we should not allow them to get away uh, with coming up with uh, uh, empty stuff like, uh, you know, who's gonna get it and, uh, you know, I mean, nobody raised those kinds of questions when, when uh, reparations was uh, talked about for Jews, uh, 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 which, you know, I mean, it's just insulting. So anyway, the reparations demand is something that should be pushed everywhere. So you say there, that was the last comment. Um, how much time before, how much time are you gonna need for announcements and whatever? Okay, can I read a little bit more then? Yeah. So we talked about uh, the human, and, and uh, I'm on page 18, uh, and the full top uh, of the, the first full paragraph, the material and human resources of Africa have gone to satisfy the requirements of life for Europeans at the expense of African Africans. Uh, this, the process of Africans producing and reproducing life has not been primarily for African Africans. It has been primarily for Europe and the white world at our expense. And this is a really important statement, I mean, uh, because Africans are grappling, uh, like others, uh, with the issue of the difference in the conditions of existence for Africans and other people. And there's a lie that has been fostered upon the peoples of the world that Africans are poor and impoverished because we don't produce anything, uh, or because, uh, but we do produce. It's just that what we produce goes to Europe and to Europeans increasingly, and, and, and more and more peoples now uh, take, having the benefit of what it is that we produce, Africans do not achieve the benefit of our production. That's not gonna be resolved through any kind of suit. That's gonna be resolved uh, as a consequence of overturning this kind of social system uh, and uh, by African people achieving total uh, liberation, control of our own capacity to produce and reproduce life, uh, to feed, uh, clothe, and house ourselves. And to do that, we have to rid ourselves of, of, the, of this external power that controls everything in Africa and around the world. Uh, so that's a really important explanation because when we talk about why we have these circumstances, you know, you got really smart Africans who tell us because we don't work or we don't have this and that when we did all the damn work. And, uh, um, uh, and so this, this just offers a scientific explanation as opposed to ooga booga -ism, uh, some spookism uh, kind of stuff we hear. Uh, you wanna get to overturning these conditions and then don't look uh, for the genetic makeup of white people or, or you know, some other kinds of, you know, misdirecting nonsense. You know, here is the core of this relationship. And going further, we say that this progenitor of world capitalism, the attack on Africa and Africans, along with the European assault on Asia and the Americas, rescued Europe and Europeans from an oppressive, thousand-year-long, disease-ridden, impoverished existence known as feudalism. This was the basis of the, uh, the genesis of the capitalist system 
as a world economy created on a base of the enslavement of Africans and others. So when we talk about uh, uh, this, we say that this, this is how, cap how capitalism got started, on the attack on African Africans, the attack on Asia and the Americas that we call Americas, and that this rescued Europe and Europeans. We're saying that the conditions of Europe and Europeans uh, were transformed as a consequence of enslavement in Russia. This is historical record. We say that it, it rescued Europe from a thousand year long disease ridden, impoverished existence known as feudalism. Feudalism was real. Check it out. S study, see what it was about. You know, I'm not, I don't want you uh, to, to accept what I'm saying, some kind of superstitious attack on white people or something like that. There were mat material forces at work that you can locate you can identify them, and then it can give us an understanding of this relationship and what it would take to change it. Um, we got another one. Okay, Uhuru. Yeah. Um, so Ngon in Tampa asks, um, salute the chairman, should reparations include Africans being returned to Africa to relocate ourselves from where we were stolen? Reparations uh, uh, should include whatever we demand, and, and it should include the means by which Africans will be able to do that. But this is based on another assumption. That is the African revolution itself, which is not gonna happen when we talk about reparations, it's not gonna be something that where the white folks just give up something just like that. Or they are going to try. I'm, I'm convinced of this before it's over. They will find uh, a militant uh, to whom they can say, okay, we will give these resources and we call it reparations. <clears throat> sign right here, you know, and that's it. it we, we're done with it, et cetera. So that, that might happen, but the point that I want to make is that going to Africa as it is, is no solution. I mean, I think people should go to Africa who want to go to Africa, and I, I want to go. I, I would be there now. I would be there now on the continent, even under conditions that have been imposed on Africa if we didn't have such a critical job to do in this country. Because there ain't going to be no freedom in Africa or no place else, even if you got reparations. All the resources in Africa are going into Europe, are going into America. They just, it's just a one way in and then another way right out of Africa if it gets there at all. So uh, we have to make this revolution. And yes, Africans should have the right and should have the resources uh, to go uh, and live in Africa. Uh, uh, but. Uh, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to revolutionize this thing. That's why the African Socialist International is so important. Because if you go to Africa, you should join the party in Africa. And if you don't find us where you go in Africa, you should create the party in Africa because we're engaged in a revolutionary movement and there is not going to be any genuine reparation that comes to us. Now, what about reparations to Africa? What about the reparations to the place where you would think about going to? I mean, Europe owes reparations there as well. So, I mean, these are real questions that we have to deal with. Oh, hold on. Oh, well, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I want to say, because of time, we want everyone to know that if your question was not answered, one of our moderators will correspond with you and make sure that the Chairman sees your question. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, Winning the War of Ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For Revolutionary Radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune into Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, or online at blackpower96.org. Did you, did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPAhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Order your copy of Chairman Amalia Chatella's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, The Political Report to the Seventh Congress at BurningSpearMarketplace.com. On March 27th through the 29th in 2020, the African National Women's Organization will be holding the Black Women's Convention, Sisters United for Revolution in Philadelphia. Registration is open for this dynamic event at anwobwc.eventbrite.com. Come see the leadership of revolutionary African women on the front lines for revolution. Featured here will be presentations from African women in our party and movement, workshops, culture, and so much more. For more information about the convention, visit convention.anwouhuru.org. 
The Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations is hosting its fourth annual electoral campaign school in St. Louis, Missouri at Aquaba Hall 4101 West Florissant on April 10th through the 12th, 2020, themed The Ballot and the Bullet. The school is a means by which the coalition opens up a new front of struggle for black self-determination within the U.S. and elsewhere. The school will teach ordinary Africans, workers, activists, women, and youth how to run for office. The weekend of events will include presentations from members of the BIB Steering Committee and other special guests. Visit blackisbackcoalition.org for more details, including registration and our list of featured speakers. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV YouTube and to catch each episode of Amali Taught Me Sunday Study. Uhuru.